make the sun set? Do you make the bright stars flee? Old crow, time is getting late. I know you a gift for me. Old bird, I see it in your talons, glittering between the leaves. And I'm swimming in the shallows You're calling from the deep And we bite our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky And we bite our time That's the beautiful voice and instrumentations of Glenn Dunn covering a song called Crow by the English band Tongue. Glenn was my first significant teacher as a young adult at art school, a passionate, sensitive and tenacious teacher that gave me, and many others since, true gifts in the form of well-crafted questions that pushed us beyond our comfort zones and helped us to get to know ourselves better so that we had something to make that could contribute back into the culture. Glenn taught with grace and care, and he continues to bear gifts, such as this song which speaks of the crow, the raven of which is trickster, creator spirit on this land in Jerram Mother Country. This series of podcasts is dedicated to Glenn's spirit of asking young people timely questions, specifically the volunteers who come to our School of Applied Neo-Peasantry to learn skills and knowledges, and to share their stories and labours in exchange for learning. Today's guests are Constanza Eldago on the right, Elenia Tearia in the middle, and Carla Gashigo on the left. Well, welcome again to another episode of uh, our volunteer series uh, at the School of Applied Neo-Peasantry. This morning we have, uh, we're doing things a little differently. We're having an interview with three women from across the world and we're going to hear a little of their stories and what brought them to here. So I thought we'd start with you, Connie. We have a connection to you already. We met you a few years ago. That's you, true. Yeah, you're teaching um, permaculture in Argentina. And uh, one of your former students, Victoria, came here a little while ago and we got to interview her and listen to her story, which was very inspiring. So, um, yeah, would you like to start? Well, we met actually four years ago. I was woofing in a farm nearby here. And I came to, like... We were like filming uh, a music uh, video, and and I already heard about you guys because another woofer, he was here, and he was like, "That is an amazing place to learn everything that permaculture and uh, sustainable theories." So I was so happy to be here in that moment, just knowing the place and knowing you and you were all really welcoming that day. And then I was back home and uh, and I was supposed to come back earlier and I had to stay. And it was like a, a real big crisis in the world and people just really were really interested in sustainability. So in that moment I thought that I had to to share with the people what I've been learning in Australia. And it was a big step for me also. So uh, Victoria was in one of these groups that I was teaching. And the main thing for me, besides giving a theory of techniques, was like trying to give the spirit what of the things that I was uh, learning here, because it's like, for me, the, the philosophical and ethics part are the the base of how we do the things. 
So it was like uh, three years back home teaching and designing. And, uh, but I was like really willing to share again this feeling about uh, sharing with people all these kind of things because uh, I was teaching and it was great but at the same time I was willing also to keep learning about you guys because you have been living this life for a long time and just having a, a conversation with you it's like really inspiring mm -hmm. and so I came again and I put in touch with Meg so when he told me that she and you you have the space to receive me I was like yeah for sure I'm going to be back because it's like we can read about all these things to design and to change but I think the most important thing is like feel how it's living this life yeah. like and be simple yeah and that's why we call it a school of applied neo peasantry with an emphasis on applied because it's experiential and we and in fact this conversation is taking place while we're all sitting around the table and shelling um, yeah so the last few days we've had um we've been harvesting garlic harvesting broad beans and um preparing uh re-preparing garden beds and sowing leeks and onions and kohlrabis and generally um, yeah collecting firewood and using the rocket stove and but having lots of really fantastic conversations and we we are also students <laughs> at the school of applied near peasantry because um, while we've gone off and done various different forms of industrial edu schooling and education what what we have have been trained to do over the last 15 years is to relearn all those ancestral and wise ways of being in the world, um, connecting back to how our ancestors lived, but in a modern context, with what we have available, what we have to salvage, what we have to uh, reculture. Um, yeah, so the Let's come back to you. Okay. And we're here from Elenia. Yes. How did you arrive here? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was studying social work in Switzerland. I graduated in February this year. Mm -hmm. And during my studies, I spent some time on YouTube watching different videos mm -hmm. and somehow um, videos about alternative living. Um, things came up and uh, I started watching some of them and uh, I just remember the first time I heard about permaculture was in in a video uh, I think it was with happy films that you made it was a small documentary about the way you live and uh, yeah I don't know it really you watch so many videos on YouTube, but this one really catched me and I saved it. And I remember I was sending it to friends <laughs> and saying like, this is how I want to be. <laughs> 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 and and um, yeah, wishes come true. Yeah, uh, however, um, I was in my studies and uh, when I finished, uh, I had room for, for this to start I don't know, experiencing permaculture. So the first thing I did, I went to a garden in Switzerland where they did that and I really enjoyed it. And then somehow life brought me to Australia um, where I, I came here already for one year in 2014 and 15. So it's my second time here, but like in this time, I, I, I really tr was trying to make a focus on permaculture because I knew that it has roots here so um, so yeah I, I started woofing and in different places and uh, I got in touch with Megan because yeah you were the first ones in this video that I was hearing about and mm -hmm. permaculture and then yeah it happened that now I 
I could come here and enjoy this uh, volunteer week with you. <laughs> uh, good to hear that story. And it, what a good complement between social work and permaculture. And yeah. it's the, the social care or the, or the human care or the people care aspect of permaculture is such a uh, you know, good mix um, in terms of looking after people and also making sure that they have access to good food and, and good medicine and good energy. And, yeah. Um, yeah. It's actually a very common thing for social work students that after they start this, they want to do something hands-on yeah. because the whole study was a lot of like emotional and like people interacting and co communication and things like that. And then you come out and you want to do something hands-on. And now, yeah, I'm think thinking, like you said, to combine both things, mm -hmm. the social work with... Mm -hmm the gardening or yeah the mm. different yeah. living <laughs> thank you welcome and Carla well my my story is more like in a magical esoteric uh, encounter with permaculture um, I turned 30 years I was living in Argentina I'm an Argentinian girl mm -hmm. woman <laughs> and I I had that uh, feeling for a long time that I wanted to have the experience of living abroad. Although I have been traveling with friends and in like more like in a yeah like coming and going, not like staying in a place. I wanted to have this experience of really staying in another place and. Um, well, my, my studies are in arts, and that's why I was living in Buenos Aires, because it's the place where you can <coughs> have, like, most, um, yeah, like, like being near all of the theatres and the contemporary art in Buenos Aires is more, like, centralised. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's going to be decentralised. <laughs> But um, yeah, I turned 30 and it was like a turning point to be like changing and thinking about my family and both of my parents, uh, although they are not living together, they are both healthy. And I thought that it was like the moment to, yeah, like to leave my own um, path. But I was a little bit anxious because I knew where to go. Um, I, besides of being an artist, I study massage. Mm -hmm. So I realized that my skills could be useful in every part of the world. So it was like just um, have the courage of moving and that's it. And I have the privilege of knowing English. That's not a that common in, in Argentina mm -hmm. and I I was talking with a friend and doing some meditations and I was talking with her about the anxiety of the of the abundance of the opportunities and and then we did like an Akashic reading that it's uh, what was that? Akashic, Akashic reading it's mm -hmm. Akashic is a, a word in Sanskrit yeah and it's a way of communicating with your guides or with your high self. Mm -hmm. And I pop up with the insight that I had to come to Australia to do permaculture, although I didn't knew what permaculture was. <laughs> so after that, I was like, OK, shall I um, follow my own um, thoughts or feelings, although I don't have a clue what this is? And the answer is yes, I'm here in Australia uh, with you guys, some feeling some beans and I feel so grateful and in the moment that I came to Australia I was like this is so beautiful and I feel so great for this brave decision that I made. Mm -hmm. And in the in between of that moment and this present moment, um 
I started seeing some videos and and I talked with some friends and actually the, in the same moment that I was going to communicate that I had these thoughts of traveling, uh, they were talking about Connie <laughs> and they were talking that she came to Australia when she was 30 and it was like a similar situation and it felt like the synchronicity really, really um, beautiful inside my body. Uh, I know that maybe people could believe or not in that sort of um, non-tangible uh, things, but I, I do believe and I do um, do my things uh, regarding that flow. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm here like following the path of mm -hmm. that and just trying to be in the present moment and mm -hmm. um, and also, if I put this into the rational thing, I think that we are going. I I think that the the theory of permaculture is it's really complete, mm -hmm. and and it, it makes me a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And the way um, they you guys um, treat people and nature and. The, this fact that com, com, time to, com, to combine uh, the knowledge of our elders or of our ancestors with the um, actual problems that we have in modern life, I think it's beautiful. And what a good thing uh, I think that about my situation is like not, not knowing that much about something makes a lot of room to learn things and um, I feel really really grateful so thank you for mm. for this thank you <laughs> yeah just touching on a few things I guess to sort of deep dive a bit more into your where you come from um, maybe Connie we could start with like what is home for you and um, what's a beautiful thing about home and what's a, a, a thing in, at, at home that needs your attention, like your community, your service? At the beginning, the first time that I came, I finished uni, I studied industrial design mm -hmm. and we have public university in Argentina mm -hmm. and I was always really grateful about that, like mm -hmm. my whole past dream university we was knowing that every day, like all the citizens of Argentina were paying my, my students, uh, my, my studying. So every time that I could be able to choose my project, I was like just developing designs uh, for the community. Mm -hmm. And when I finished uh, uni, uh, I found, besides I was uh, being like, designing recycling products mm -hmm. uh, it was really different but that in that moment that I was a student because it wasn't actually a thing for the community it was more like having a uh, conscious about materials or uh, a little bit of the environment in that moment mm -hmm. so uh, I heard about permaculture, I did the PDC there, and I was like, oh, this is awesome, actually, because this is not just taking care just for, of the environment, also the people, also of uh, being really smart doing that. And the first year I ch just came here to learn all the things to help home in that moment, yeah. because I thought that that is the thing that we did in Argentina, actually, because we have the resources, but we are not thinking uh, in a Sorry. like in this holistic way to help our community. Mm -hmm. So that was the first main thing here because I was able to know all of you like really quick, like in a really synchronicity mm -hmm. way, mm -hmm. because uh, it was like so fast how I met everyone the first year because I was like really deep into help 
yeah. uh, my community with these tools. Beautiful. So, do you want to just give a, a like a, an example of one of those projects that you did in your? Community? Yeah. So when I was back, uh, I was talking with everyone like crazy, like mm -hmm. what things that I was learning here. Mm -hmm. So one of my teachers of uni, he in that moment he just moved to uh, near the river because we have a huge river mm -hmm. and he lives in a floating um, neighborhood mm -hmm. so he wanted to develop a new floating base for the houses in that na neighborhood because they are really expensive mm -hmm. and we were talking about all these ethics and how to be smarter with all the materials that are already like waste materials yeah. and it was a nice challenge for us because we were like just uh, relating with the community of that part of Argentina that it's like really small and we figured out that it was a lot of uh, people like uh, taking the trash and separating it mm -hmm. to sell it again to the system and we were like, hey, wait a minute, we can use, like, for example, all the bottles, not giving them it na uh, again to the system. Mm -hmm. We can keep that bottles. And we were like uh, building these floating bases for houses with those bottles that they were uh, at the beginning uh, bringing to us for these communities. Mm -hmm. So we were helping them because we were paying more than actually the 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 system were paying to them mm -hmm. we were cleaning our space because mm -hmm. it, it, it were bottles that they came like really nearby mm -hmm. and we were also like resolving this uh, thing about these floating bases that they were really expensive and people mm -hmm. they just can't afford them so uh, and and also we were teaching how to grow food in all this system of developing this project so yeah uh, it was like a really nice way to give back uh, those things besides i'm i have another like uh, my profession is like maybe a little bit different of what permaculture actually is mm. i was just just putting all the ethics in the things that i used to do yeah. Because I also knew that I had to use my the tools that I already had in Argentina. Yeah. It wasn't any point to say like I want to live 100% that as here that you have been living your whole life. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I have these tools already developed in Argentina. How I can uh, improve yeah. these things that we can do with all these ideas and so this like ethics. Re repurpose exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, it like, and also being able to work <coughs> with Earth. Uh, meanwhile, we were doing that, and with the community, uh, started to make. And besides, I I was in, I was working in a, growing food in places that they weren't um, a place of like my own. Uh, it started to make so much sense. What it's a home for me that is everywhere that is a piece of earth to take care so i was just traveling helping some uh, maybe community business how to be in sustainable in a holistic way and designing for them and always working the land so in i started to feel like i didn't belong to any place as humans being we said that this is the barrier or something. I just started to feel that I belong to the earth. So home for me is any place that I can work with the earth and feel that uh, I'm helping it and, and helping the human beings to improve themselves. That's yes. beautiful. I, I really like that. Um, I mean, it, it, it makes me think of just how our like old time ancestors, the pond slime that we came from um, is so like universal, but even before that stardust and whatever formed us and the ancientness of that. And I feel really um, deeply 
embedded in this little biome where we walk for lots of our food and medicine and um, walk to the local co-op to get food from further away but this relationship on foot um, is, is like really really close but when we go to the coast and um, to fish and to camp down by the coast as a family it's really for us it's it's taking similar rituals and similar acknowledgements and, and observations and beholding of other country and um, with full of gratitude for you know the in that case down at the coast for the flow of fish um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be resource based it's of course it's just the beholding of country as so fundamentally alive and so connected to the living and dying of the living of the world and um, so yeah belonging I, I really understand what you're saying about home is where we are as a mob really and where our presence and consciousness is yeah. Elenia you're what's home for you? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Yeah, I would just maybe say it more simple for me. Home is a place where I feel free, where I can be myself, where I can find support from the people around me and where there is respect for each other and mm -hmm. where people help each other. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. <laughs> like that. So it's more connected to the people than to, to a place. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, thinking about that, those um, social home, that, that home is, as a social environment, mm -hmm. um, what's one thing that you would, that you, know, you hold really dear, like that's really, that really makes that um, possible, that sense of home? Mm -hmm. um, and what's one thing that you would like to be in service to in order to Im improve? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think what really bonds a home together is, for example, the the thing of eating all together on a on a table, like sharing food and um, talking and. Um, yeah, because everyone, I think, has different skills and abilities and occupations during the day. Oh, sorry. But um, the, the the process of eating is something that we all share and we all at some point do. So that's a thing, is something that is really important for me in a home. And uh, what I would improve is, uh, is yeah, what comes on the table. <laughs> so... Uh, what kind of food do we share? What kind of drinks do we share? And where do these things come from? Um, what is supporting for our body and what is destroying for it? Um, because at the end, the yeah, food is a, is a big part then of our health at the end, which is, can be physical or mental and... Um, yeah, and I think that's a big challenge, which, of course, everyone has to start at some point, I guess. <laughs> but, yeah, let's just start by little steps, yeah. improving yeah. little things and looking at uh, what is in your food, like reading the package, reading where it comes from, mm. and, um, yeah, little by little, I yeah. think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I've said for a long time that if we could return to a culture where there's at least one grower at every table in the family, so when a family gets together, mm -hmm. um, there's one person that brings the consciousness of the earth, so the farmer or the peasant or the fisher person or the mushroom forager or you know someone who's who dedicated their lives to a relationship with the earth in order to, to bring that table back on. Then we have some of the origins of our food 
the story of those origins being told and being brought back. Yeah. But when we just get our food from the supermarket, the origin stories are missing mm -hmm. most of the time. The mm. ingredients are there, mm. and whether they're harmful or not. But mm -hmm. And I feel like that's a big disconnect, and with mm. the, the whole emphasis on uh, agriculture to get bigger, to get bigger, mm. and soon we'll have nobody mm. but robots doing the farming, mm. or you know, one farmer in a million. Yeah. And I feel like very quickly with the culture has changed because there isn't an uncle or there isn't an auntie mm. that comes to the table with those stories of the yeah. land. And I feel like permaculture is doing that. If, if there's a permaculturalist in mm. each household, mm. there is those stories brought to the table. Mm. And it's just the openness of the others to receive those stories really yeah. in For order sure. to ri in enrich the, the table through the culturing mm -hmm. and connection to the more than human world that is our food, that is our nourishment. Mm -hmm. And therefore there's this building of the reconnection to what our lives stand upon and what we are dependent on. And that then is a conversation back to the mother or Gaia, the earth, Bachamama in your culture. <laughs> um, yeah, like the re-honouring of the feminine through our food. Yeah. Something that I want to add to that is um, where you can interact with the growers as well, I think is markets. I really love markets and I think anywhere you are <laughs> in your town or in the neighborhood town, you will find the markets. Just try to uh, yeah, be free in that time and just go there and talk with the producers, see what's seasonal, uh, ask them about whatever you want to ask them. And so you can also build up a connection yeah. with, with yeah, the raw material that yeah. you make your food with. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's a really good first step. Mm -hmm. and, and the second step might be to find out if there's a community supported agriculture farm nearby, which you might, we were talking about yesterday, where you might go out and and work for a day or two a year um, as an experience as a whole community and then you pay a certain yearly annual fee to support that farm so they so in abundance times the food flows into your house in leaner times you're still supporting that farm and you're not having to sort of like um, yeah have this consistent uh, the farmer is not like constantly worried he or she is not going to be supported if, is it, if there's a failed crop and so those connections to farmers at the market and then potentially even going out to that farm yeah, some right. exchange or some sort of support and then that cuts out the middle people the big supermarkets mm -hmm. and yeah <laughs> and Carla what about <coughs> you what's home for you well, uh, it's really nice to be the last one in the conversation because I can hear the ladies and agree with them. Um, but to add something more about uh, food, that is a really good, really, really, really good point. And, uh, and being a child of of the earth, that it's also a really, really good point that Connie made. Um, I was thinking while you were talking about reciprocity, I think that, uh, and communication, I think when I'm in a place where I being heard and being support, and at the same time I can hear and I can support the other ones, I feel at home. And that could happen in your actual blood home or not. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's that that moment of um, acknowledge the other one and the diversity of the other one, or even what we were talking about yesterday, the unique um, role that everyone has. Mm -hmm. um, and be able to be with different uh, ages mm -hmm. in a family. Uh, and if you are in a place with different uh, cultures in one family, it's, it's 
beautiful. Like the mm. the moment when you start doing things in a collective way, and you can uh, actually feel that the like the sum of the of the parts is even bigger than the individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm have a, a bigger purpose and I can be supportive and at the same time I can support the other ones and e even with a meal or even with a touch or with a hug or with my ears um, or yeah or I don't know maybe a, a financial support whatever you can do like uh, as, as you were saying like that farmer that maybe needs that uh, extra support not to feel the pressure of uh, being successful with the crops every time. Um, yeah, I think that family, it's, it's that, like the net that holds you uh, in the uncertainty of life. And um, I think that's the power of the people, like gathering around. And also the freedom, as you were saying, um, a place I think that home for me is in my own body, but also it's when the context give me the freedom of being myself. Of course, like um, being responsible and non damaging the the surroundings, right? Like mm. not not being like uh, in a um, saying like an, as an excuse, like I'm being free and then I can damage everything that's around me. No, the mm. other way around, like I'm being free and I'm being responsible and powerful mm. and I can make with this powerful a better place to live yeah. for everyone. I Beautiful. think that's home. I think that really seems to me that freedom is with freedom comes responsibility and in fact freedom comes through living in service yeah. um, and not living in a power over relationship yeah. with anybody so just before um, you three arrived I was freshly back from three nights in the forest doing a vigil uh, a fast and um, and I do this on a regular basis now like at least once a year go out and fast for three or four nights and it's quite hard and um, but very beautiful and very profound and I get to tune in to my wild man as much as tune in to the wildness of non people places so in the forest and um, to come up against, or not against, but or sometimes against when there is fear, mm. against some big forces in the forest. Um, <laughs> and a koala came around on the last night, this time and the last night, the time before, in two completely different places of the forest. A bull koala came racing through the bush like a massive boar pig uh, and grunting and groaning and I just knew that it was a koala be because of the sounds but it was like a massive beast coming at me full bore and just pitch black because there's no fire when I go I don't take any light so very dark and I've got this wildling that I know it's not a big bear <laughs> it's not a polar bear it's not a black bear it's not a brown bear it's just a little koala, but it's got a big bear sound. And, mm -hmm. and so this kind of awakening of my own wildness and, and my own response to this and how I uh, adapt to that challenge. And it may well be a challenge or it may be the fact that it's come, uh, two different koalas have come for me, I think it's, I don't, I don't actually I'm not going to go there about why that's happening but um, it's very profound that it, it's happened twice and it just what I call those times in the forest is my fear country 
so I get in touch with my fear and I get help with that mm. <laughs> by things like koalas and some and you know in a previous time a huge windstorm with trees just like dancing wildly across me like and and I'm camped amongst a graveyard of trees that have fallen over and I and I'm lying there imagining a harpoon of a tree limb coming straight through my chest mm. and sitting in that utter fear it's a rite of passage of sorts. Yeah. So I'm not um, wanting to, to kind of create that drama to say, right, where's, you know, what's your story there? But like any way you relate to this question, I might start with you again, Connie. Like, where is your wild woman? Where do you find your wild woman or connect with your wild woman? Mm, I think that every time that I'm able to be in silence and with nature i feel like i don't have any boundaries and i i don't feel trapped and that feeling grew up with me since i was a child uh, being at school or at uni i grew up in a beautiful a beautiful house with lots of plants and trees and my mom was working a lot when I was a child, so I grew up with my grandparents. And I had this sense of freedom when I was growing in that place, like just discovering things. And yeah, when I started to have like a regular adult life, I felt like every day more trapped. Mm -hmm. And I find my wild woman every time that I find myself like just getting out of that logic and doing things like this like just be free of mm -hmm. any type of thinking or a uh, thing that I supposed to do besides every time that I'm back in in society I do I do a lot of things uh, I find myself in this wildness thing that just saying goodbye to that all the things that I used to do and every time that I'm, I'm doing it in a more responsible way like just knowing that all the things that I believe that are good for society are going to be taken care mm. but I find myself in this break moment that I need this connection and to not feel any boundaries between me and nature so mm -hmm. uh, it's like in that moment that i can say goodbye to all these uh, supposed things we have to be in this modern society mm -hmm. and i can be uh, i wouldn't say no one but almost no one in these places that no one mm -hmm. it's like asking for the other to be something and just be grateful with everyone and uh, be able to talk about feelings with people that they maybe are not uh, putting any idea of you. Mm -hmm. So I find myself in sometimes, like uh, there are lots of stories also in Latin America about women from Amazonas that when uh, people, the white people came and try to put them in like in these modern societies the way they she, they just went away of that or their behavior was like wild for them and not appropriate mm -hmm. and I feel every time that I know that stories mm -hmm. I feel like fuck I'm that's why people think that sometimes I'm too wild for the city or because mm. I be, my behavior is like that. Like sometimes I don't care at all. Mm. So, mm. yeah, I I find my wild person still meanwhile I'm in these two worlds of living in nature and be really in the society playing my role as a designer or as a project person mm. and doing these kind of things like just getting out like well this is done i'm out and just people don't get it mm. so it's like and then i'm in these kind of spaces and i feel so in peace yeah. mm. and i think that that peace comes from 
understanding that we have, I mean, the archetype aspect is helpful um, um, in, you know, the, we all have capacity, many of us have capacity to be diplomats, many of us have capacity to be the wanderers, many of us have capacity to be, to also step into our wild woman or wild man selves. And, but that, so the diplomat and the wanderer are still quite accepted, you know, the young person traveling to experience the world. Uh, the diplomat, of course, is, is, is you know, very fo focused in our culture and almost to a point of problem uh, in terms of uh, the smoothing over rather than standing in one's truth, the, the, the smooth giving away power in order to, to keep things diplomatic. And sometimes the wild woman and the wild man needs to stand up and say, no, um, hmm. you, I am this, this is in me. And that's exciting. And so while, you know, there's a lot of uh, pejorative responses to Jungian psychology and the archetypes there, I feel like they're still really pertinent and powerful. And because we move in patterns and we need to be the nurturer, we need to be the mother or the father, we need to be the wanderer at various stages and, um, of our lives and we also need to be wild and to reclaim that and I feel like in a way um, one of the things that students get here or volunteers how to run a, a modern school without any money exchange and so sort of the labour for learning um, model is a kind of subsistence economy model of education where we're all students and we're all storytellers so therefore we're teachers um, <laughs> and there was one other thing I heard there Connie was um, in your description of the wild woman as, as you get to know your own wild woman the wildness of say the dance of the you know the thrashing out and saying no <laughs> and screaming to, to to let people know that you are wild in this instant becomes wiser over time as you get to know your wise woman it's less abrasive it's just there quietly and that's beautiful too so thank you for bringing that yeah. you're welcome yeah. Yeah. Elenia where's your wild woman <laughs> Um, yeah, I think men, uh, in my mind I can be wild when I'm, <laughs> when I, yeah, when I find quietness, like you said as well, no stress, uh, a quiet place, um, and no, like, opinions from others, just listening within myself what I really want, and then I come up with lots of ideas and um, yeah and I, I, I also find strength in them because I I'm like okay if this is what I'm thinking when I'm just by myself not influenced by anyone then maybe it's something important and maybe I should really fight for that and um, wildness in terms of l physically or living uh, was maybe in uh, one week that I went um, to live in the forest with my school and yeah, we, they, like we camped outside, we didn't have a tent, just a small roof, which is called a tarp mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, yeah, we didn't have toilets or showers or something like that and then oh, I, right in here. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, this is maybe was wild for me because uh, I'm used to a lot of luxury, a big house with four bathrooms and mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, just washing myself in the very cold river or just um, yeah, having the toilet outside, bringing home my toilet paper, <laughs> the used one, and yeah, not yeah things like that that made me feel. <laughs> For sure, much more wild than, uh, how, or or not not having a heating, just dressing up really warm. But then you have the other beautiful side when you when you see the the beautiful 
stars at night and things that you miss uh, in in your town and um, and food wise wild I felt when uh, uh, with one woman um, in the permaculture garden in Switzerland we walked through a piece of grass like uh, uh, it was a wild how you call this like meadow? yeah just like grassland. grassland with flowers in it and she was like uh, we were picking things for our salad and it was like plants that I've seen thousands of times but I didn't know that we can eat them so yeah. it's like we were picking picking and picking and at the end we made up a salad and yeah <laughs> and we'll do that here too yeah. Yeah. picking flowers is a nice way of being wild yeah, picking a salad you know, <laughs> a weed salad yeah. exactly beautiful yes. thank you thank you ah, Where's your wild woman? Uh, my wild woman. Mm, I think I. Yes, I. I think my wild woman is the wild child that I have in, inside and has been wild, like forever <laughs> since since ever, mm -hmm. like being really near the ground and um, playing and talking with the plants. I. I have some photos that my mom took me like without me notice them and I was talking actually talking with the plants I I don't have that I think I I lost that uh power maybe sometime I can talk with them again uh hopefully <laughs> but um yes like being being with nature in a beautiful way uh, with the spirit is is one way. I was thinking also the the moment that I'm in really dark places. Uh, I feel wild, but I feel um, secure. I I don't feel the being anxious. But maybe if I'm in a dark place that it's close, it's not the same feeling. Mm. But if I'm in the bush, I will be feeling like really pleased of the mm. night. I I love to be mm -hmm. outside in an, in the night, and mm. that's that's really nice. And um, I think, as you were saying, like the moment you stand up for your wildness in in my case it was the moment that i realized that i just wanted to dance i've been dancing since i'm eight years old i did a uh, ballet classes that that's not wild <laughs> <laughs> at all and then i changed um when i turned 18 and i was already a professor of that because it was like 10 years of doing ballet and having like the exams and blah 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 uh, then I start studying um, communication and I realized that uh, it wasn't although I was doing great at uni and it was easy for me to just uh, read and repeat and <laughs> and be able to cope with the expectations of a student I was like, I, I don't know if I want to spend time in in this. I want to just dance. And fortunately, in Buenos Aires, we have an art uh, public university that it's... Uh, I'm always saying this when I'm able to have a podcast or something because I I really love it. That in, It's one of the only ones in Latin America that it's public. So there is a lot of young people coming to Buenos Aires to study arts. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really good about our country. And I I felt wild when it was like everything, everyone going to different college and different uh, work. And I was maybe like in my pyjamas going to college and just <laughs> like dancing there. And I study, we have different um, like roots to study arts and one of them is dance and inside arts you have different roots and I study 
a free expression. So it was also like a moment that I realized that we can have like a pre-verbal way of manifest ourselves that it's really animal and mm. and really um, like intuitive and and honest because you cannot move as someone else although you if you want to copy them mm -hmm. uh, because that's also a way of learning of course mm -hmm. it's a human thing we always do ours our own movement mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really personal and I, I think that in when you embrace your own way of moving and you try to pass through the the ridiculous or the the shyness of being different from the other person but also like being able to dance together in the difference mm -hmm. i think that that's really beautiful and see like everyone like dancing crazy and maybe someone wants to shout and just do it and just shout and it's there and or someone wants to run in the place and just do it it's like uh, be free to of course being aware of not uh, punching anyone or being really aware of your own uh, self space mm. uh, that's also like one thing that you start learning about being in like maybe there are 50 people in a class or 20 people in a class and everyone wants to express it, it's really good like to manage all that energies but yeah, I, I think that was a good combination of being like in the city, but being like a rebel in the city because I was doing things that for the market is useless. I cannot mm. grab my um, improvisation dance and just put it on a package and give it to you. Yeah. Um, well, there there are some different things about performance that are that way or they... Uh, make like the issue or or there are some uh, res like research about what happened in the present moment but I think that it's a good way when I feel in my present moment and if I'm not dancing another way of embracing my wild it's also when I'm with someone else and I'm able to take care of that um, <laughs> of that uh, person like being uh, in a partnership or being with a friend mm -hmm. and that mammal moment of being together and just patting each other or mm -hmm. just sleeping with someone mm -hmm. or even having sex with someone is like that I think yeah like the corporal thing non-verbal although I mm -hmm. the people that is going to listen this <laughs> is going to say this girl love to talk um, yeah, I think that that's a really powerful thing, and yeah. it's like universal because you can dance with yeah. everyone. I love, I love that mammal moment. <laughs> that's beautiful. Mammal moments. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. We've almost, almost peeled all the broad beans while we've yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. It's just been such a pleasure to speak to you all and hear a little more of your story and to be able to share it. Yeah, beautiful. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank making you. this moment. Old bird, you and I are brothers, bonded by earth and wood. Old crow, you and I are sisters, swimming in a bowl of blood. Old friend, you and I were strangers Living by a restless sea Friend, I knew when the wind blew That you were calling me And we bought our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones Sink like stone, and we cross through mud till we reach the sky. And we bide our time, and we 
but our time And we shed our skins And we shake our bones And we sink like stone And we crawl through mud Till we reach the sky And we bite our time But our time and we shed our skins and we shake our bones and we sink like stone and we crawl through mud till we reach the sky and we bite our time.